Today we're speaking with Karen Beatty of the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center. And I know you, <laughs> we work together. That's right. Today we're gonna to be talking about what I call the OF or original fruits, native fruit trees here. Why should anybody be interested in planting some native fruit trees? I think first and foremost, people are interested in having some fruit yep. to eat, right. but also they're really beautiful. Like mm -hmm. there's, we have a lot of different kinds of species that, uh, that produce edible fruit and they're different shapes and sizes and forms. Right. So they fit into different scenarios mm -hmm. in, in people's gardens. But in addition to being beautiful, I think, you know, they're well adapted to right. our soils, our climate, um, just like any native plant would be. So they're probably going to be a lot easier to manage than your typical sort of fruiting yeah, variety. On average, they're going to require less care, um, be a little more drought tolerant, right. uh, more pest tolerant on average also. Right. And then also, you know, a sense of place, right? We're sort of, as we, as we grow and more people move here, uh, some of these trees are threatened. Some of them are just not, uh, you know, they've, they've sort of been either grazed out by deer. There's a lot of things like that. So it, it really helps bring back that sense of place as well, correct? Yeah, I mean, I think of native plants, including native fruit trees like familiar friends. It's like, you uh, know where you are based on the plants around you. Fruiting varieties, you know, it's really for us. We're wanting to get a bountiful mm -hmm. crop and all that sort of thing. But these really maybe help out wildlife. Yeah, and sometimes more so. I mean, some of our fruiting trees, the fruit's a lot of trouble or it's really tiny. And right. even if it might be delicious or interesting or just beautiful in the garden, really most of the fruit may be going to wildlife, birds and mammals. Sure. I, I think that's one of the, the funniest things when I first started learning about natives. So I learned pretty quickly that a lot of stuff is jams and jellies. What are some really good varieties uh, that we might want to look at in terms of native trees? There's the Texas persimmon. Yeah, I think that's a good one to start with. Um, that's one you see a lot around Central Texas. So if you pay attention to trees in wild places, you've probably seen them. One thing to remember, they're dioecious. So they, there's male and female trees. So if you okay. want fruit, you're going to want a female. But they make a great, you know, it's probably about an inch, inch and a half little ball sized persimmon. Mm -hmm. It's really delicious if you let it get perfectly ripe. Yes. You have to let it get perfectly <laughs> ripe because it is unforgettably mouth puckering yes. if you try to eat them even a day early. Maybe a good prank. It's a good prank, yeah. <laughs> My children have all tried them unripe and they all remember the day. <laughs> it's a beautiful garden tree too. It has, it's really pretty. It has like some structural interest. A lot of people love crepe myrtles. Uh-huh. Uh, and this is really a good substitute because this hat really to me has the exact same form and has that really nice sinewy limb if you, if you aren't mm -hmm. cutting it off all the time. Yeah. Um, and so if you don't want, uh, and, and with crape myrtles, there's a lot of issues with honeydew and, and, mm -hmm. and powdery mildew and whatnot. And this, you can get that exact same form. Yeah, the form is similar and like the, the color and texture of the bark, that right. smooth kind of whitish gray bark that's really striking is the same on persimmon. And they're really easy to grow. They are very yeah. easy, yes. And the wildlife loves them. Everything eats persimmons. Everything eats persimmons, <laughs> all right, check. And then just really quick with those, what about size? What are, you, what, what are we looking at? I'm they're sure not very big. I mean, I, th I think the ones I see on average are maybe 15, 15 or 20 feet would be average. They can probably get up to about 30, 35 feet, but not really any bigger. And are they slow, fast grower? I call them pretty moderate. Okay. Yeah, they're okay. definitely not a slow grower. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then a cousin of theirs, the eastern persimmon. Yeah, that one we see a little less in the wild. In central Texas, it's more of like an east Texas and, and eastern United States species. But that that the fruit is supposed to be even better on the right. eastern persimmon. Um, it makes a bigger tree. Uh, the fruit's a little bit bigger, um, a little lighter in color, kind of right. a yellow red. Um, likes a little more uh, moisture than yep. our, you know, than the Texas persimmon, which is more adapted to our rocky soils and little rain. Right. So if you have a little deeper soil, a little richer soil, you could grow that one. Okay. And I know we've used those in our, our bush, uh, the Bush Presidential uh, Center up in Dallas, and that and that's sort of a, a Blackland Prairie habitat, mm -hmm. and they're, they're thriving there. So those yeah. are, that's a great option. Well, uh, let's jump into plums. Yeah. Everybody likes plums. Everybody likes them. I love plums. <laughs> what about the Mexican plum? That's a common one that we the, see a lot. Yeah, the Mexican plum has really gained in popularity, like you, its use in landscaping. You see mm -hmm. it a lot in shopping centers and sure. parking lots. I, I call it a great parking lot harvest. Ah. Yeah, I embarrassed my sister once by um, 
<laughs> we were exiting a store, and I was like, give me a bag. There's plums ripe right here. <laughs> so we had to stop and collect a big bag of plums You're on the way nerd. to the car. I know. They were ripe and <laughs> falling on the ground. They're a beautiful tree. They don't sucker and form thickets the way a lot of our plum species right. do, which can be tricky for garden sure. spaces because you don't really want a thicket in right. your yard for right. most folks. But the Mexican plum makes like a good maybe 35-foot tree, okay. um, single trunk, a really beautiful round canopy. Right. Um, it's but, a good choice. But, that's, but those are a little bit better in understory condition as well, though, right? They they can they can take some sun, but they part shade. I would say is where they really thrive. Yes, because yeah. I know I've seen them fully exposed, and they they'll do fine. Mm -hmm. But in summer comes along, and they look look a little. They will look a little wilted. Little, little ragged. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. So. Part okay. shade, I'd say, is ideal. And then just quick others. I know you mentioned the they're, they're sort of scrubby-like, but mm -hmm. the Chickasaw plum and yeah. the Creek plum. I have not tasted the Chickasaw plum, but I've heard that that one is more delicious than the Mexican plum. Right. It's a little more like east and north Texas. Um, that one was moved around by native groups all over Texas throughout hundreds of years. So right. you find them and you also find them in like old uh, home sites. They were a really popular plum right. for settlers and, and, and all kinds of people for many years. Um, they had like a little bit more moisture? They do. So they need yeah. a little richer soil, yeah. you know, a little more moisture. Um, they can get about probably about the same size, maybe a little, actually they probably stay a little smaller. Yeah. They stay smaller than the Mexican plum yeah. um, because they do form thickets. Yeah, right, yeah so they right. sucker. Right. Mulberries. Yeah. Let's talk about the red mulberry. The red mulberry is my favorite because it makes a decent sized fruit that you might bother to eat. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> we have another species that, that makes a microphylla, microphylla, that species makes a tiny fruit, but okay. the red mulberry makes one that's maybe, I don't know, close to an inch long. Um, is really delicious when ripe and they make like a very, you know, their foliage is like a very delicate, um, understory tree. Right. It's great for like a part shade understory right. situation. Not to be confused with the white mulberry, which you right. see out there a lot, which is an invasive species. Right. This uh, would be a great substitute if somebody is right. you know, interested in white but doesn't want to plant. You know. Both are really hardy, but the, the red mulberry is a great one and, yeah. and a great option. And the only complaint I've heard is that the birds get the fruit before yeah. you can sometimes. But yeah. hey, that's okay. Yeah, it's you know you're not gonna have like a bumper crop off right. of one of those off of either of our native mulberries, right. but it's nice to find one that with ripe fruit and you sure. know, spend a few minutes. Okay, <laughs> and then what about let's get in some mass producing really bigger guys. What about the black walnut? I love the black walnut. So the black walnut is an interesting tree for a bunch of reasons. It's gorgeous. It's big. It's very rugged looking. Um, it's known for its wood. You mm -hmm. know, it has really fine grained uh, hard wood that was, has been in high demand for a very long time. Um, we don't have big ones to harvest for that anymore, right. but they make a walnut that, with a really delicate flavor. A lot of people have probably tried a black walnut. It's very different from a regular walnut. You have to kind of go to some work. If, if you ever tried to shell one, right, right. they have those uh, really rough black shells that can stain your hands, but mm -hmm. I think they're worth the trouble sure. if you're willing to go to. And that's, that's gonna be a pretty big darn tree. That's a big tree. <laughs> yeah, that could, you know, that it can get 100 feet right. tall. Right, right. And then really quickly, we've got two left to try to get in here. Uh, Blanco crab apple. Yeah. A really great tree. I think we we like to think that, oh, our native apple, you know, at least we hear crab apple, we're like, oh, it's not quite an apple. It's a little disappointing in terms of the fruit, in my opinion. It's not something you're ever going to want to just eat off the tree. You right. can make jams and jellies. Jams and jellies. And it's a beautiful tree. It's, it's beautiful. Small. It has a really interesting structure. Right. In the fall, the foliage, the foliage. is glorious. And I know that's a lot of people want some color in the fall. That's yeah. a great option. So I think it's a great option as long as you're not hoping for like a bumper crop of crab apples. Right. And then uh, one that you said you were very interested in, want to talk about <laughs> the pawpaw. The pawpaw, because I have not had success with it. Um, right. It's a tough one to grow in central Texas, but if you're looking for a challenge, it would be a neat one. It's more of a tropical type fruit. It right. makes like a, almost like a banana or a I mean, mango. they're pretty large, right? They can be. The ones here are a little smaller, yeah. uh, maybe six inches long, the, the fruit. Um, it has like a custardy banana flavor mm. and the tree is very beautiful. It has kind of a short trunk and then it branches and makes a very round, um, a round sh shaped canopy. 
and the leaves are really long and glossy. Right. Um, the fruits are interesting. They do like acid soils, so, so it's really more of an East, East Texas. Texas. Yeah. yeah, I've heard of folks in Central Texas having a little success, but you definitely want to put them where there's some deeper soil and more moisture in the soil. And I know with this species, I've, I've read, uh, being from Mississippi, we, we used to grow them, but it actually had a refined range, and it's one that really spread all over the United States because indigenous culture saw yeah. it as such a, a valuable food source. Yeah. Well, Karen, thank you so much for, for sharing our time. And if anything, besides just being a horticulture expert at the center, people should listen to you because you've partied with Prince. <laughs>